Cool everybody's time, it is uh, 104. Thank you for being here. Um, and let me first begin by saying thank you for registering. And we have masks in the back if people feel they have a need to. Um, I'm encouraging everybody to get vaccinated. Uh, I know the town ordinance allows us to be mask free for those that are vaccinated. So it's important in this day and age of COVID, I, I just wanted to, to preface that. But most important of all, thank you all for being here. This is an opportunity for a community conversation. And the idea really is to have your town leaders and law enforcement hear from you. So the way we'll begin this program is we will have Police Chief Calamaris, as well as uh, Officer Weha, who is very involved in community policing, to be able to kind of give some background as to what happened last week but also the ongoing commitment to public safety and not just the incident that happened in Southport, but also a comprehensive look at community policing and, and public safety and precautions as well as protocols that are effectively in place and also be able to learn and hear from the broader community. Then the goal is the remainder of the time is for all of you to come up to this podium and have your voices be heard. I think there's nothing more important than for us as elected leaders. Let me just introduce everybody on the stage here. You have the, the two police officers. Thank you for your service. Represent Steinberg, who represents Westport, who came on and signed up. Thank you for being here. Represent Laura Devlin, who represents the 134th district of um, Fairfield. We have Sherry Coleman who is recently elected in RTM District 10, which represents this area. And then we have... Ken Astorita. <laughs> Forgive me. Ken Astorita. Ken Astorita. <laughs> Your chance to say hello. <laughs> and Peter Britton, um, Frank Patisi, they're all your four representatives in the RTM in the town's town governance. Uh, we have Representative Jen Leeper, who is your state representative, representing the Westport area, the Fairfield area in Southport. Um, I, before I start, I want to acknowledge some of the town officials that, that are here. Too many to mention, but I want to thank you all for being present. But I want to extend a, a specific welcome to uh, Reverend Peggy Hodgkins uh, from Episcopal. Thank you, Trinity, and, and thank you very much for being here. I know uh, Paul Whitmore had responded and he may be coming in from Congregational. There's Paul, thank you and Laura. Thank you very much for being here, uh, integral part of the very community. I, I also want to extend a warm welcome to Monette Thompson, uh, Hamilton. And well, stand up. Monette uh, just recently joined Trinity Episcopal and she is going to be the director, she is the director of youth programs. So I, I wanted to extend and acknowledge, thank you very much for being here, but also more importantly, a big Southport welcome to you and your family and to the community. So nice, thanks for being here. So I'm gonna get right into it and have Police Chief Calamaris be able to share some facts, but also some of the nuances of what went into play. But also, Chief, I think you acknowledge the fact that you wanna be able to hear from the community. It's not just from a standpoint of the public safety incident that happened, but also in regards to car theft, uh, in regards to traffic safety, the whole gamut that is of particular interest in the community. So, uh, Captain Calamaris, thank you. Chief Calamaris, okay. please. Thank you very, very much, and thanks for joining us. Here's a microphone. Okay. All can yours. Can everyone hear me okay? Do I gotta hold this? All right. So, uh, my name is Bob Calamaris. I'm the chief of police for the town of Fairfield. Okay. And uh, <laughs> um, I'd first like to thank everybody for coming here today. Um, it is a beautiful day out. We all should be outside. And, uh, you know, obviously from the numbers that we have here, this is a, an, important, uh, an important discussion that we have with all our community leaders. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to apologize for the first select woman who could not make it here today. Um, she got injured and uh, she's going to be fine, but she was not unable to make it. She texted me this morning and asked me to 
uh, send her regards and she says that she wishes she was here today. Um, so what I will do is I will start with the Southport in incident uh, that occurred because um, I feel that that was kind of a catalyst um, or maybe the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, uh, there may be people in this room that have been subject to or have been victims of a crime, whether it be a uh, car theft to your vehicle or uh, your car may have gotten stolen. Uh, that seems to be seems to be kind of the 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 trend, not only in Southport, not only in Fairfield, but across the state of Connecticut, in addition to uh, the entire nation. Um, right about 2017, they started changing uh, cars to where you just bring the fob inside the car, you push the button and it starts up. And uh, most, of other, most of us in this room probably have a car that, that does that. Um, with that luxury comes a cost. And uh, you know, if you forget your keys in your car in the past, which was uncommon, you weren't able to get into your house. So you usually have to go back and get your keys out of your car to get into your house. Well, now um, you don't need your key fob to get into your house or your car fob to get into your house. So, um, so that has created some challenges for law enforcement. Uh, it has created some challenges for our citizens. Um, it has created some challenges for police officers and um, the other day we had a robbery at the Southport School. Um, I can tell you that the uh, two suspects were taken into custody. It happened about 7 o'clock in the morning, a little after 7, about 7.30. And uh, the suspects were taken into custody uh, between 2 and 4. One of them was about 2 o'clock, the other one was about 4 p.m. Um, I will say that we are very fortunate in the town of Fairfield with not only the resources we have, but the technology we use to combat crime. Um, we are also very fortunate for the police officers, men and women, that we have in our town. We have, um, we have an incredible police force. The police force is made up of 108 men and women. And uh, we are fortunate that um, we have good benefits and good salaries. And that supports um, higher quality candidates and higher retention rates uh, throughout our police department. Um, so the Southport robbery happens at about 7.30 in the morning and um, two, uh, one juvenile does the robbery, the other juvenile uh, drives the car and um, you know what, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn this over to Lieutenant Waya who's going to discuss the details of the, uh, the robbery so that um, if there are any questions regarding that then um, we, can, we can address them. Thanks, Chief. I'm Lieutenant Eddie Wyo. Sorry. Speaking of key Speaking of key fobs. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Eddie Wyo, Fairfield Police. I currently run our Public Affairs Division. And uh, as the Chief was saying, 7.30 in the morning, there was an armed robbery at Southport School. In a nutshell, two teachers arriving for work, they encounter a juvenile who holds them up at gunpoint. Later on, we find out that it was a facsimile weapon, but just as terrifying in that moment for them. And um, they did everything that someone in that situation should do. They maintained their composure. They didn't try to fight with this person. It, it, they realized that this is a property crime, essentially. They want my wallet. They want my purse. I'm just going to give it to them. I'm not going to be confrontational. So. The assailant leaves, and the next thing that they did was they put their school into secure school. Because God forbid there were children in the school, God forbid there were children on their way to school, those teachers did what they were trained to do. They wanted to make sure that they took those next steps to minimize any potential casualties if a fugitive was still at large in the area. The next excellent thing that they did was they called 911 right away so that the police were responding and could take over the investigation at that point. So I wanted to start by saying that we're very thankful that everyone in the long run was safe and that the teachers did a commendable job managing the situation. As the chief said later in the day, we did take those juveniles into custody and it was part of a multi-jurisdictional investigation. And that's an important thing for you all to know is that the Fairfield Police Department doesn't operate in a bubble. 
we collaborate with other agencies all the time, and that gives us a much higher and quicker success rate in these types of investigations. Thank you, and, and, and I think it's important for me to ask of both of you, uh, the protocol, you know, the, the, the call, the incident. I just wanted to compliment law enforcement, and I want to compliment the Southport Schools administration and, and their entire faculty for how they handle things. Could you kind of elaborate the, the, the level of coordination, but also, more importantly, uh, do you have a process in place to notify the surrounding communities, meaning our, our two very important churches in the community that have nursery programs, our, our local businesses in the area, um, Pequot Library. Uh, I, I just wanted to be sure that, that this community is, has a plan to notify all the surrounding community members should any of these incidents occur. It's unfortunately the world we live in, but at the same time, could you give some aspect of comfort or is that a point of consideration as well to make sure that the surrounding community is very much aware and not getting the information second or third hand through social media. And that is one of the big purposes for this forum was for you to share the exact facts and what proceeded, but more importantly, the kind of opportunity we're gonna hear from people in the community to give you feedback on how we can be better coordinated and collaborate. Yeah, and that's an excellent concern and an excellent point. So the answer to that question is yes, there are mechanisms in place. Not everything always goes according to plan. So the feedback that we got from this particular incident and anytime an incident like this happens, we do debrief because we do want to learn where the bugs are, where we fell short. So in a situation like this where things went 99% right, one criticism that I would put on ourselves is that it sounds like the other organizations in this area were not notified what was happening at Southport School. It is something that we do have mechanisms in place to do that and we've immediately reviewed those mechanisms and made sure that everyone who's in charge of implementing those procedures have been informed that moving forward this is how this has to happen. So yes, that was a shortcoming. We didn't notify the two preschools that are in the area, but the mechanisms are in place. We did review our procedures with everyone who needs to know how, how to do them. As far as the community at large, we do rely very much on social media, our social media, trusted social media, to get information out there to the entire community. So we always urge everybody to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We get that information out there, accurate information out there as timely as possible. Thank you, and, and I just want to acknowledge the crowd that you've got elected officials, but, but I think our role here is to listen and to get your feedback. So, so please, prepare yourself, come on up, and, and come on up and give your viewpoint. Let's start right now. Virginia? I just one point of clarification. It was not an attack on the school. It was on two teachers walking to the school. So that's a clarification here, because you could argue that there should have been something within the school that was the teachers going back to the school to the flag, but I, and it could have been anybody on the road. So I think the fact that you have the social media that puts it on Twitter and the caption all that is actually really helpful. So that's one comment. The other is the school has done a lot of training of the teachers and, and the students, and I would urge the other organizations to make sure they do those those run groups because they knew just what they needed to do when they needed to do it, and it worked by clockwork. And then when they talked to the kids later, they reiterated that. And it was a real safety reassurance for all of those kids to know what to do and for the, for the faculty to know what to do. So training, training, training. Mm. Thank you, Virginia. And, and, and because you're the first one, you got to pass without going up to the podium. <laughs> Um, and, and so before we, we take on more of the feedback, because that's critical, we want to hear from all of you. I, I want to ask of our law enforcement as well is, what kind of preventative measures, neighborhood watch programs in which you provide education and, and, and training for community, what programs do you have? Not just simply some of the random things you say, lock your car and, and you know, lock your doors, but, but what real programs that you offer from a standpoint of law enforcement in the community that you could articulate to the audience? 
Well, in addition to um, the messages that we do, we leverage the media every day to try to get important information out to everybody. But you're asking, in addition to that, um, I personally teach a crime prevention through environmental design course. Um, we haven't gotten a lot of requests for that, but I want to put it out there that I'm available to do that for any community group, any organization in Fairfield, where basically we take a look at all levels of measures that deter crime in any space, in any environment. So there are high cost recommendations, there are moderate cost recommendations, and there are zero cost recommendations for immediately making your, your home or your neighborhood a hard target. We also uh, recommend, <laughs> you, you were talking about neighborhood watch programs. Yep. Technology is kind of replacing neighborhood watch programs by creating this amalgam between neighborhood watch and social media. So we're seeing next door dot com or the next door app growing in popularity where neighbors can connect with each other and the police are not in those chats and that's by design it's so neighbors can communicate with each other about things that they think are concerning and after that point can then notify the police but it doesn't take the place obviously doesn't take the place of calling 911 in an emergency that's happening in real time Tony okay. can I can I ask you off absolutely take you. Ken now that I got your name down <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, and guys, thanks for coming today. I really appreciate it. So I wanted to ask you a question, probably that's on the mind of, of most of the people that are out here. Southport, as you know, is a very popular area for people to come and walk, um, particularly like this area down here, down by the harbor. Um, in the evenings, afternoons, people come, they just take strolls. I live in the Southport Woods condos. A lot of the residents there, you see them walking all the time. Is there any advice or tips you can give to an individual who is out walking that they can be aware of to perhaps um, anticipate something and prevent something bad from happening while they happen to be out walking on, uh, on the streets? Are there things that they can do to prevent them from being victims of this type of stuff? I guess that's, that's my question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think it's situational awareness, you know, um, and being cognizant of the fact that, you know, if you're work, walking out in the dark, it's, it's probably less better than walking in the daytime. You know, it's just situational awareness. Uh, some people walk with their ear pods in um, and, and can't hear a thing around them. It may be the walk and the, the, the hearing or, or uh, limit, limits their hearing, and, and, and wants, they want to uh, relax, uh, but at the same time, there are some, you, you have to balance that, you know, so that you can uh, have your observational skills. Um, you know, just little things like, um, you know, when you, when you park somewhere and you're leaving your car and going into your house, just take a look around. Take a look around and see what's around you. Um, and these are kind of, these are kind of things that you learn as a child and you, you grow with them, I think. And, th and that's really situational. That's what situational awareness is. Um, and, you know, it's not something that we necessarily teach, um, but it, you know, it should kind of just be like, um, be aware of your surroundings and that anything can happen. And usually, if something feels wrong, it usually is. It's your body and your mind telling you psychologically without you recognizing it that something is wrong and you should do, say, or you know, uh, tell someone else about it because that, that often happens. You know, you say, I saw that car and it just committed that crime up the street and I should have said something when, it, when, it, when I saw it and felt that, but I didn't. I, I think there has to be greater education like uh you know, uh, Sergeant, we have said, and, and thank you for that input, Ken. And, and please come on up, come on up to the podium and please come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, hi Tony, nice to see you. Hi, Good Mark. to see you. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, hi, Jennifer Barahone. I'm a Fairfield resident. I'm also a social worker. Um, I also happen to work in the largest crime in Connecticut state history, overseeing the recovery from the shooting at Sandy Hook School for nearly six years. Um, you know, my daughter lost her phone, take, got it taken away the other day for a consequence, and she left and walked out the door to a school bus and said, but what if there's a shooting tonight and I don't have my phone with me? So these are the realities that our kids are living with. So 
the question I want to focus on, though, is the prevention piece, because hurt people hurt people. And it, we need to, everything that you're talking about, and, and actually Lieutenant White came and spoke at our, um, our Moms Demand Action, it's all about how do we prevent gun violence from happening, right? Because I don't want my kid living in a world where there's lockdowns happening. I want her to live in a world where there's not gun violence. And it's the same idea. We can be safe and not put on our earbuds, and we can only go during the day, but we want to prevent crime from happening, and there are proven ways to do that. And I think a question for me, to some of the elected officials, would be our investment in things like early childhood, because we know that the most rapid time that brain develops is between birth and three. And we know what trauma does to the brain and what it causes people to do. And so this is by no means to give a pass to people who offend or who commit crimes, but tougher laws, all of that, that, that's fine. And I'm not suggesting we don't do that, but if we are not going to the root cause problem, if we're not going upstream to understand why people are committing crimes, the desperation on, on substance abuse and to get, to get money to support their habits. You know, people who are traumatized are people who are substance abusers, right? People who, you know, uh, have crime of opportunity because they don't have adequate employment are, are those who commit crimes. So I just want to make that point that when we, you know, it needs to be part of the conversation, right? As much as we're protecting ourselves and doing all the things and locking our doors and, and all of that. And we had our car rifled in our driveway the one time my husband forgot to lock his car. I get it. I've been a victim of a car crime myself, but we have to have both parts of those conversations at the same time. I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's a broader conversation in regards to uh, looking at solutions and, and, you know, birth to three, the, the cognitive and the supportive environment it's an entire ecosystem and, and I completely agree yeah. with you. And, 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 and I, I think, used to run diversionary programs. I don't know what's happened. I know with COVID and all of that, there, but you know, I literally ran a diversion program where first time offenders got put into pro social activities into the community. So it prevented recidivism and happen. And those are the kinds of things we need to invest in if mm -hmm. we're going to prevent these crimes from happening. No, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. And thank you for your work. <laughs> Any thoughts and comments? So thank you very much for your comments, and I do agree with you. And you know, there was an example, and I don't know if the chief will want to talk about this in more detail. We had a meeting that I had organized with our state's attorney general, our public defender, who work in the juvenile courts, along with our police officers and our delegation members. And one of the examples that was given was a 15-year-old boy in Bridgeport who had committed, uh, I think it was a stolen car and there were gunshots involved and all of that. And he's in a single family home, but his mom works at night and thinks the kid's you know, just fine. Kid's 15 years old, he can't read or write. I mean, so there are some significant problems, but a piece that I'm really trying to get my arms around and it's at beginning stages because there's so many layers is our uh, justice department has said, our judicial department has said, the state of Connecticut, our teeny tiny state of Connecticut, has more programs for recidivism than any other state in the nation. So I want to know, what are they? And that, that these are state programs, right? So they, there's buckets of programs under like four different arenas. And then there's all sorts of nonprofit activities. And so what are we doing? Where's, what are we funding? Are, is it working? How many kids are being served? Are there things we should invest more in, things that just aren't and we should not? So I think we really need to understand that landscape also because we hear a lot, oh, we just need to add more programs, add more programs. But what's the understanding of what, what we have? And I think it's two-prong. Absolutely prevention, but what we've heard over and over again from our police officers is that there is just a total lack of consequences for certain kids that continue to reoffend and laugh at law enforcement, and there needs to be some actions. Like you took your child's phone away, there was a consequence. Mm. So right now there just don't seem to be. Representative any. Leeper, Representative Steinberg, you want to add some comment, and we'll we'll get to the other speakers. Uh, I was very taken by the speaker's c comments because, for way too long, certainly Tony and I have had this experience in our years in the legislature. We've been cutting programs that we know work and are particularly critical. And when you talk about birth to three or even early childhood, those are the programs that have often suffered 
over the decade in which, because of our long-standing budget deficits, we've been cutting these programs. We're at a crossroads now, and the ARPA funds that we've been talking about, both at the municipal and state level, offer us an opportunity to expand or experiment with these programs and really show that they make a difference so that when ARPA funds expire in 2024, we have the justification, the evidence to sustain these programs for the long term. And I'm hoping these are the conversations we'll be having in Hartford, given the fact that uh, thanks to a, an up market and federal funds, we are as flush as we've ever been. And this is an opportunity for us to really focus on the programs that we know are effective and make the biggest difference. Thank you, Representative. Is this on? Yeah, it thank is. you. Thank you, Tony. And thank you to the Chief and Lieutenant Waya for being here. And also over the years, and more recently, Chief, all of the time you've uh, given to me to run a lot of these issues and challenges um, by you because these are really complex issues. And I think I'll respond to, to two things. I think I'll, the lack of consequences is, is something that we hear often in this conversation. And I first want to recognize that when an incident of crime happens, it's serious and it's scary and it's painful. There are victims of that crime and that experience is real. Um, but also the lack of consequences is hard to pinpoint in the sense that, so in 2020 here in Fairfield, there were 20 juvenile arrests, both for crimes against people and crimes against property. So we could have really, really harsh consequences like we did in the 90s, but that doesn't necessarily lower incidence of crime. So I think we need to be thinking more um, critically about these diversionary programs. And at that forum you hosted, Rep Devlin, uh, a couple months ago, I think it was the public defender who said that for the children who participate in the diversionary programs, 85% of them never commit a recidivist, never recidivate, recidivate again. And that's pretty um, compelling information. And in terms to why we have so many programs in our tiny little state, I can't help but wonder if that is also the effect of being one of very few states that doesn't have county government. So when we have local control in a really decentralized system, each community is responsible for their own juveniles. And, and I don't have the data, and I agree with you, we need to, we need to get that on, on why um, and whether or not that's the best approach to have such a decentralized uh, system. But I think there are still a lot of questions and a lot more information we need to collect, and I'm grateful to hear from the community about this important issue. I want to re-steer back to our community and, and listen to the people. Uh, please, our, our two religious leaders in Southport, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Tony, thank you for organizing this uh, listening session, and thank you all uh, for being here today. My name is the Reverend Peggy Hodgkins. I'm the rector of Trinity Church across the street. We have a wonderful nursery school with 120 children. And the wardens, the vestry and I, very much like uh, Paul Whitmore's Congregational Church down the street that also has a nursery school, um, you know, I personally feel responsible for the safety of these children every day and their families that are bringing them to school. Um, I'm so pleased to hear about how the situation was responded to by the police. Uh, there are just a couple small things that I would, uh, but they could be huge things if, if if we could fix them. Um, the first is that the first reports that came out, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear them. Um, it was Paul who called me, uh, the Reverend Whitmore. And so I'm so grateful to that I knew. Um, our school director did hear, I think from the police, but I'm not sure, uh, Lisa Bond. Um, she didn't have time to call me. It was, everything was so fast. We had families coming in cars with loads of kids. So we had to act quickly, and we decided to lock down our school. Um, I think that was the right decision, given that the assailant was not apprehended. The first reports that came from the police did not say the... Uh, so, so my first point, I guess, is that it would be nice if I knew, as a leader uh, in town, and, and my school director could be called directly when something like this happens. I know it's hard to act in the moment, but if it were possible, that would be great. Maybe there's some app out there or something that can help us with this. Um, the second point is that the first report from the police didn't include the race of the assailant. We live in a predominantly white community, so I'm just being really blunt about this. But there are people of color in our town who um, 
you know, if I, my very own neighbors um, that I would want to contact and alert them, um, if it's a black male and my ne next door neighbor is a black male, I want to make sure that he's safe, um, that he's not going to be apprehended by mistake or something. So that's a very real issue for us because I have uh, two neighbors who are African American um, that are, that work very closely with me at the church and I want to protect them. Um, I want to honor them. And so those are my brief points, but I'm, I'm so grateful to you all for your, for your quick work, and thank you. Hi, Paul Whitmore, um, one of the ministers at Southport Congregational Church. Um, so thank you very much, Peggy. Um, thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, one of the things that I, that I wrote to, um, to uh, Brenda Kupchak um, pretty much right away afterwards that you have addressed today, which I really appreciate, um, is just is recognizing that there was a loophole, um, <clears throat> that, you know, that the churches with the preschools and the children and the parents and so forth need to be um, contacted because on a, on a time-sensitive basis because we have to make decisions. We're responsible for their safety. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, we appreciate that. We need that. Um, I appreciate this forum. I don't have no, you know, need to, you know, personally vent or anything like that. Um, but uh, just wanted to recognize that, uh, and also say that I'm, I'm glad that the uh, that we're not only addressing the immediate needs, but then we're also looking at some of the systemic uh, drivers that might be happening um, that uh, uh, that are that are maybe creating this problem. That if we're smart. Um, that we will want to address in terms of you know the, the programs to try to cut these things off before they happen. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you both. And, and uh, you know, uh, Sergeant, did I promote you to Sergeant? <laughs> oh, it's devoted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoops. Then I'm going to make him a captain. I'm going to make him a captain. Uh, but I think you addressed it from a standpoint of better communications, and I think that's important. And I think it's also important for everybody to recognize that all four of your RTM members representing your district are here, and they're hearing it loud and clear. And, and uh, anybody on the RTM wanted to be there able to actually, that? There, there actually was a good question um, that the young lady had. Is there an app that people can go to, particularly those who want to stay as far away from Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as possible? I know, and I'm not even sure what it is anymore, but I get alerts all the time that, you know, there's an accident, an intersection, such and such, and the road is closed. But I never seem to, I, I never see anything that I'm alerted for, like in this instance where, you know, there was, you know, an armed, possibly potential armed robbery in the air. I never get anything like that. Is there an app that the town uses or that, that people can, um, you know, download that, that they can use? Yeah, we have, we have uh, all the major, uh, social media apps, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, um, we, and also Nextdoor. So um, I will say what, what commonly occurs is that when we have an incident like this in Southport is it's kind of like all hands on deck. And um, we're, we, we are more focused on the investigation than we are on the notification system. So, and, and, may, and maybe that's something that we need to change. And uh, because um, you all are eyes and ears in our community, and if there's something that we don't see, it's something that you may be seeing. So uh, maybe uh, a, a quicker notification system. Um, you would have to be on that, um, but um, one thing I can suggest, and, and Ed could probably, uh, Lieutenant White could probably talk about it a little more uh, uh, articulate, is uh, like an app like Infinite Campus that some of the uh, uh, universities use or the um, public schools. Is, is Infinite Campus used by the? Mm -hmm. And maybe you can just describe that. Sure. So uh, one point I just want to reverberate is um, while we absolutely did um, missed the opportunity to, to share information with the surrounding schools. Um, it is a normal part of our protocol. So it was something that we had to call ourselves out on and say, this can't happen again. We can't make that mistake again. But uh, to the chief's point, there's also a balance between focusing on the, um, 
immediate area that's being investigated, we, there are certain things that we have to make sure are happening before we can move to that next level and say now it's time to make those surrounding notifications. So obviously that first three to five minutes that the event is happening and unfolding, the focus is on that specific site and the investigation in that area, making sure everyone is safe. But definitely no more than that three to five minute mark should go by before we actually make those notifications. And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. Um, we have an email blast list for all private schools. Um, so anytime something happens at a private school, within that first five minutes, a notification should go out that at least generally says, Southport School is in lockdown, um, stay tuned for more information, updates to follow. At the very least, that information should be out there so that the nursery school at Trinity and the nursery school at Southport Congregational can make decisions about what they want to do next. Uh, more information obviously would, would be better, but at the very least, they should know that something is happening in the area. As far as Infinite Campus, Infinite Campus is an alert system that the public schools use. Um, I want to say maybe about Six years ago, we compiled a list of private schools to include the nursery school, pre preschools and nursery schools as well, and made sure that there was contact information, cell phone numbers, main lines, and email addresses for private school directors loaded into Infinite Campus so that if something happens at a public school, we can say to the public schools, when you send out your alert, please check that box that says private school directors, private school principals, so that you know what's happening at the neighboring public schools. We wanted to close that loop as well. So as I said earlier, the mechanisms are in place. We just have to take a look at it again and see why it didn't work last time and make sure that doesn't happen again. Thank you, Lieutenant. I got your proper classification. <laughs> again, I, I want to thank- We have a changeover in leadership. I know in both of our schools for our school directors, so maybe that's something we can update. Absolutely. Well, I think the commitment is the channel of communication is open. I want to thank both of you for your leadership of your churches and, and representing your community for being here today. And, and the communications has been established and, and you'll, you'll get the information and your RTM members as well and your state delegation. So uh, thank you. Yeah, now, just one more, if, just if one I may, more, may just can, one, I just want to go yeah. to Frank because I, I, I want to get Frank's perspective because his wife, if I may, is a, was a teacher at one of our nursery schools yes. and got the information secondhand. And we're hearing about it all secondhand, but I, I want Frank as an RTM member, but also as a husband of a loved one that was in that situation to, to share what a terrible feeling it is and how important it is for us to kind of instill a process that people can believe in. So Frank, please go ahead and thank you for being here. No. In between football games for yes. your kids. <laughs> Hence my attire. I apologize for that. But um, yes, I mean, that was a big question I had. I think you kind of answered it. But my wife is a uh, teacher at Trinity. And she called me that morning, obviously very upset. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, just saying the school's going on lockdown. I don't know any information. She actually made me keep my kids home. <clears throat> and then we had to go drop them off later. But I guess my big question was, you know, where was the breakdown with that notification process and you know, how do we fix that? Yeah, so it, it comes down to taking a look at who's responsible for maintaining an updated list and who's responsible for blasting out that information and just reviewing those procedures. Maybe I used to run our school safety division years ago. Uh, something that I used to do was every, every one month, every two months, I would send out a test email and uh, just to keep those lines of communication open and sometimes one preschool would respond to me and say hey you're emailing this former director of this other preschool who isn't the director anymore maybe you should reach out and so it's just keeping those lines of communication open so we have to have a discussion with the new leadership there I, I think it's a great exercise that we have and thank God everybody yes. is safe but but I think chief and, and and lieutenant thank you for being here this is why we're doing this, right? It's a check, double check, hearing from the community, and, and I appreciate that. And, and Frank, I, I think in our conversation, you really convey the emotion much more emphatically. Yes. You were worried and yes. you were concerned, and I think that's what we want to be able to convey to the community, I, that we hear you and, and we need to understand better how we do that. Go ahead, I, come on up. Uh, we want to hear from more people. Yes, ma'am. You've been so patient. Um, this has to do with safety as a walker. I don't know if you want to speak. 
start this? Or you want to it's all yours. It? It's, it's your okay. stage, ma'am. Okay. This is, um, I live in uh, South, Southport Place, Pequot Landing, and I walk every day with my little dog through Southport. And uh, I had a very uh, unusual experience uh, several months ago. I was walking through the Southport station and a young man um, picked me up and he started twirling me around. And I'm not very big and he was smaller than I was and I thought, it's okay, you've got this. And my dog sat there and wanted to lick him and kiss him. Um, <laughs> she does. But he finally let me down and he said, do you remember me? And I recognized him because I had seen him in the uh, real estate station before. And one of your security vans was in the lot. Um, and I did report him and they, they took off. He, was, he told me he was coming here to the library. And they took off and I haven't seen him since. Um, the other experience I had was a neighbor of mine recently, this was two weeks ago on a Sunday, was approached by a man, very, very well-dressed, uh, also short and small, um, but all he wanted to do was probe her. And she reported him, and the police did come to the house and uh, took her full report. But this young man also walks through Southport a lot, and he spends a lot of time at Jay McLaughlin uh, every Sunday. He's in there. So this is just for every woman, everybody out there to just I carry pepper spray with me every time I walk, and I carry an alarm with me that I can pull if anything like this happens again. I'm sorry you had to go through that experience, ma'am. Well, it may help somebody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Santa, sir. Thanks, Tony. How are you? I'm good, Tony. Thank you very much. And thanks for putting thanks this for one here. together. Really appreciate it very much. I'm glad you're all here. My name is John Santa. I live here in Southport. I've spent 25 years of my life uh, working in criminal justice reform, uh, first as the founder of uh, and uh, CEO of Multi-Justice Initiative, where we wrote a book called uh, The Justice Imperative, Surveying the Criminal Justice System in Connecticut. You can get it, Amazon.com, The Justice Imperative, go for it. I have a copy. You got a copy. Signed by you. Maybe, maybe, Laura, you might have a copy too. Yes, yeah, signed by me. Nevertheless. I'm currently on the Sentencing Commission of the State of Connecticut, where we work on uh, sentencing policy, trying to make it better and more effective. So much for my, uh, my bona fides. I want to tell you something, my friends. We have a good crime here. A good crime. Now, it's unfortunate that these poor teachers were, were terrified by what happened, and they got a 38 poked in their, poked in their ribs. But you're here. You could be watching a football game. You could be polishing your silver. You could be talking to your mother-in-law, but you're here. That's good. Because awareness, then motivation, then action. That's how we work. I'm glad you're here. And by the way, this is terrible. But you know what? If you lived on Seaview Avenue in Bridgeport, and your kid was going to the fourth grade at, at Howland School, this would be about three times a week. Okay? And if you think that doesn't matter to you, well, forget about it. That just happened to come here because they'd already tried to stick up all the people in the other towns, and you're next. And guess what? There's more coming from where they were. When a third grade kid in the inner city fails math, you lose. You lose because that kid is on his way to no good. Probably for a lot of good reasons, but no good. So you got symptoms, you got a problem. What symptoms we're looking at here? Well, this unfortunate situation is a symptom. It's not the problem. It's not the problem. So I caution you, under those circumstances, to watch yourself. Because we've been here before. In 1980, we had a war on drugs. And, oh boy, we're going to get those guys. And we're going to lock them up and throw away the key. And, oh boy, and we're going to do, we're going to incarcerate. We are the most incarcerating nation in the world. In, in America, we incarcerate 732 people per 100,000. In Germany, 70. One-tenth of what we do. Because their criminal justice system is way different than ours. Hello? Hello? Because they address the underlying re reasons of poverty and ignorance, that kids fail in third grade math, the poverty of the inner city, the lack of jobs. That's what brings it about. And think about this. 
eight of ten people to find their way into our, into our criminal justice system, eventually into prison, are mentally ill and or addicted. Both items that we know how to treat. And if you think for one minute that there's any kind of serious mental health experts go, activities going on in our prisons, forget about it. Forget about it. Or if there's some drug addiction stuff going on there, forget about it. It's not. So they go in there and they get punished. They don't get corrected. You're paying for the Department of Correction. You're getting the Department of Punishment. And by the way, my friends, where I come from, $2 billion a year is a lot of money. That's what you're paying for it. You, 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 me, Tony. We're all paying for it. Police chief, we're all paying for that. So, so that's not the way to go. We've made progress. When I started this thing, we had 20,000 people in, in prison in Connecticut. We're now down below 9,000. We have 20 prisons. We're down down about 13 prisons. Our crime level, granted, there's a spike here because of COVID and a million other things, but our crime level overall is what it was 35 years ago. That's good. That's a good thing. So here's what my suggestion to you. Let's go someplace. You have state legislators. They write the laws. They're here with you today, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch that aren't here with you today. Call them, write to them, email them, send them an owl. I don't care what you do. Get to them and tell them you want things changed. Tell them you're sick and tired of running a Department of Punishment and you want a Department of Correction because they can do it. I know they can do it. There's a lot of good people working in the Department of Correction. And, you know, demand, demand some change. There's an opportunity here to make this a real wedge issue, which is kind of a hot thing these days, to polarize our, our political people and to polarize our electorate. Don't fall for that trick. Don't fall for that. We all know that the Democrats have control of Connecticut for about 30 years right now. And Republicans like Tony and Laura Devlin have been terribly frustrated with trying to put programs ahead, but they haven't gotten very far, unfortunately. But, but there has been, and you well know, there's been collaborative, bipartisan work mm -hmm. done in Connecticut. We need more of that. We well, John, thank you. And, and I, I will acknowledge that you have taught me so much about uh, Second Chance Society and, and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think you also share the fact that what happens in Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, mm -hmm. impacts our community as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. It's an entire related ecosystem. Absolutely. But thank you for your it's work. It's all of a piece. Good. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Lindsay Cornell. I'm a new resident. Um, Welcome. So hopefully I have a fresh perspective. Um, I'll be loud enough. It's fine. <laughs> um, I moved here from Stanford, was in Stanford in an apartment in the Harbor Point area where there's a lot of gun violence, but that was common. Before there, I lived in Richmond, Virginia in the city, which I love all my heart. A um, lot of crime, right? Coming to Southport, I didn't think I'd see that. Um, I think it's, it's something, I wouldn't say we have a lot of crime, right? But there's a reason why I chose to live here with my husband and have our kids here and have lovely neighbors um, and, you know, affordability, fantastic schools, fantastic community, right? Um, but there's something I think that being younger and having an experience growing up in the 9-11 era, right? And having these text alerts and things, that's one thing I wanted to point out, um, going to college we used to have a text alert if something was happening and i think something like that could meet i'm sure you all have looked into things but that could be something that could be very helpful instead of an email because you get that probably more immediately it'd be easier for a dispatch to send it out depending on certain levels of right like the schools would get it first level and then it would go to anyone who signs up like think of when we lose power and eversource sends you mm -hmm. the text your power you is out and you're like, I know it's been out for 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, so that's one thing I would point out. Um, and, you know, I think it's, as everyone's brought up, it's, it's sad to think that the children are better and well equipped than most citizens. But I think it's true. The idea of, you know, I'm a runner. I know to have one headphone in or look around constantly and it keeps you on edge. I also love crime podcasts and true crime, so this is, you know, maybe I maybe understand a little more than most, but 
those are things that I think kids understand more because they've had to do all of these things. Um, so, you know, Fairfield U, I'm sure, has alerts set up and things like that. That could be something we could tap into that could be really easy for everyone to just sign up that wants to be a part of it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. You got to meet your RTM members, your state delegation, and law enforcement. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Mi Tran. Yes, I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I live in Fairfield in District 8. Um, I wanted to address something that Representative Devlin um, asked, I guess, generally speaking, about the ser services in place. So I am a public interest attorney in New Haven Legal Assistance. Um, I have been a, it, I'm seeing that you can't hear me. <laughs> um, I have been a contract public defender in juvenile court in New Haven. I am also a special education attorney and expulsion attorney as well. So one of the programs that have been in place and then was cut before the pandemic actually was um, through CSSD, which is the Court Support Services Division or Department, um, because what the courts were seeing in juvenile court was that a very large percentage of kids who were um, caught up in the juvenile justice system were actually had an undiagnosed, untreated mental health problem, we're not surprised, and had extreme school failure because they had um, a learning disability that was undiagnosed as well or undetermined. So what we did was the probation officers would refer those cases over to our unit, which was only two attorneys, and we did hundreds of cases every year to get these kids connected to um, special education um, services, mental health treatment providers, et cetera. Um, you know, so that, you know, that was one of those services. But was it successful? Not necessarily, because there are huge systemic problems. I work in New Haven. My kids have special education. My own personal, my biological kids have um, special education in the Fairfield School District. So I have this unique perspective of seeing, you know, yes, I referred my kid clients in New Haven to special education. Some of them had major speech issues. They were getting no more than one hour a month of speech services. That's a huge systemic problem. We're talking about educational inequities, right? My kids who have a little bit of a, stu not a stutter, but more like an articulation problem, was getting 10 hours a month of special education services in Fairfield. So just because they're getting these services doesn't mean that we can't also fix the other underlying problems, which are systemic. So I don't think we have too many services in Connecticut for these kids because we are seeing, you know, even though the car theft rates skyrocketed during the pandemic, we are actually at pre-pandemic level. So it's there's a little bit of a hysteria around the car theft issue. My, you know, I'm a victim of that as well because we didn't lock our car and someone broke into our car. But I think the conversation needs to be grounded on how can we help these other children? How do we make sure that not only are they getting support services while they're facing, you know, um, court issues, but how do we get them before that? And how do we make sure that the richest state in the nation basically is having an education system that makes sense and is equal across all towns? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. So if I could just make a, a comment to what you said, and before you leave, if I could just talk to you because I want to write down what that program was. I didn't quite get it. Um, there uh, is one program that comes to mind because we're lobbied on it a bunch in the legislature for a line item in the budget, right? Project Longevity, because it's an mm -hmm. evidence-based program and it's something that's talked about a lot. Uh, let me say two things. First, nobody that I know is saying take all these kids or take, you know, lock them up forever and just send them away. In fact, at the forum that Rep Leeper mentioned that I organized in September, I was really touched at the end with the closing comments of everybody, the amount of compassion and in fact, the public defender talked about an 18-year-old who called him when he got all A's on his report card because he had nobody else who would, he could share that with. So there is a tremendous amount of compassion. And I think you're so right on so many levels that you identify. The thing, and maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a pipe dream of mine to be able to get our arms around what are all these programs. Because right now, nobody can name them all. 
but are there monies being sent somewhere where they're not effective that we could redistribute, right? If we didn't have all this federal money coming in, our state would be in deficit right now. So we, I think we really need to look at this because it is systemic. So what can we do in the most effective way to help these kids, right? I mean, a 15-year-old who's doing crimes, his mom's working, thinks the kid's great, he can't read or write, that's a problem. I do. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you. Can I, can I just say something yeah. really quick? Um, we talked a lot about an alert system, and I just want to pivot back to that really quick. We have um, Fairfield Alert, and if you go to fpdct.com, um, we historically used that for uh, storm alerts. Um, roadways that are closing uh, that we have advance notice on uh, but we can we can pivot on that and just use that if everybody signed up yeah, yeah. So, I mean, It's, yeah, it's very similar to that, yeah. right? And can you demarcate by zip code? Um, no, it would it would be. Um, on what? It would well. You have to go on and sign and register okay. for it. Okay. Yeah, and okay. if you go to our website fpdct.com and it's Fairfield Alerts. Great. I think that I just one comment. That's that's a great idea. Yep. Is there a way to get that in like the patch or something like that so that it, well that people we can, the we can provide that directly to yes. the RTM members yep. and you can share with your. Great. Go ahead. Hi, Tony. To thank everyone Caroline? for being here. Um, I'm going to kind of pivot the conversation a little bit, that's okay, to focus on traffic safety. Sure. Um, my name is Carolyn Aldino. I'm a Southport resident. Um, and we've just kind of noticed in the past couple of years, um, you know, we all know that this is a walking community, whether you're in Southport Village or you're, if you're up near um, the Mill Hill area. Um, and, you know, we've just, neighbors, you know, anecdotally, I know that we've, a lot of us have contacted the police department in terms of the volume of traffic that has increased, specifically as well as um, all of the calls coming from the fire department. You know, um, some of us live, you know, right off Mill Hill Road, we can hear the fire trucks and EMS ripping up and down, I mean, quite literally two or three times a day. Um, it's, you know, it's a big issue now, obviously, you know, the construction at Mill Hill School will end hopefully soon, but got two kids in there right now. Um, but especially for us walkers, again, it's a walkable community. Um, just uh, the traffic, the amount of uh, times that I've almost been run over, my children have been run over, other children, just the lack of lighting, just in terms of, and again, I know it's an influx of new residents into the neighborhood, um, but it's just, it just seems like it's, it's getting to a point where it's becoming quite dangerous. Um, and I know it's also true down here where there are, you know, quite a few walkers down to the beach where, you know, they used to start their daily walks at seven o'clock. They can't do that now. They start at six, you know, whether it prohibits it or not. Um, so I don't know if you have any clarity or any suggestions well, on how we can alleviate some of this. T uh, Tony put together a couple of years ago a, a, a forum similar to, that, to this spe specifically for traffic safety um, in Southport. Um, what I can share with you is we, we have a traffic safety unit that specifically um, takes complaints from the public and then looks for ways to uh, preventative measures to try to take to, uh, in, or to improve the conditions. Um, and we do that by education, enforcement, and um, engineering. And we work closely with the engineering, the engineering department in the town uh, so, for example, if there was an area that showed a high propensity of accidents in an intersection, uh, we would then look at that area, have engineering Can look at it. Can I tell you right now? <laughs> What's that? Can I tell you right now? We've pulled, dot, we've pulled all the police records. So, Mill Hill Terrace from yeah. Osborne Place to Bronson Road. Yeah, I, I, will, I, I will do a pitch for Chief Calamaris because it was six years ago and Chief Calamaris then was Officer Calamaris who was in charge of the traffic safety. Yep. So I know you're very knowledgeable and, and also Carolyn, you have your RTM members here that that live in the area and who know and, this issue, and know this issue as well. Times. So I, I think that the key is working together. Yeah, let, let you me know just, your neighborhood best. So 
it's, it's an opportune time. But I think we're very fortunate that we have a law enforcement chief that is extremely knowledgeable about traffic safety, diversion programs, uh, you know, planters and, and, and various. The other issue that we talked about was I actually wrote to uh, the national mapping companies, Google Map, Waze, because the, 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 the electronic rediversion has moved traffic into residential neighborhoods that right. normally never had. And, and so I, I think that those are all things in which we all collaboratively can work together. But traffic safety, speeding, I, I can happily report that one of the bills that passed out in a bipartisan basis last year was that you needed state approval to reduce speed limits beyond a certain level. We passed a bill in a, in a big omnibus package that now affords local municipalities to be able to reduce speeds in local streets. So you can reduce it down to, you know, if there's a regulated 35, you can reduce it down to 20, 25, and the town is given that allowance to do so. So the community activism, but I believe the other pathway is you need to petition for additional stop signs or speed changes, your police commission. Would that be that's correct, correct. Chief? That is correct. Yep. Okay. So I think that's, that's one of the things. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, density traffic and speeding. Those are pathways for all of you in the audience to know that know your police commission. They're active. They're your first point of contact. If there's a, and, and we have Charlene Lebo yep. who is on the police commission. Thank you very much, Charlene. Um, so that is an important pathway. Would you agree, Chief? Is there anything else you want to add on that? Well, just the fact that, um, you know, we have 270 miles of road in the town of Fairfield and Southport. And um, it is, uh, it's, it's not just Mill Hill Road. Oh, it, is, <laughs> it is everywhere. And what we find from an enforcement perspective is that when we go to a neighborhood, when you call us, we're going to come. And when we come, I have called it, well, what I'm, what I'm about to say is not going to surprise you. When we come, oh, they it's down. usually you and your neighbors that are speeding because you live there. I can guarantee that. So I'm, I'm going to pass the mic. Boy, that's now. a lot of the day here. Thank you. Thank you. Tony. Hi there. I would just like to bring it to back to the crime and safety. Yes, please. And Thank you. Can we, I, I'm, I just don't know what kind of presence the police have in Southport, and if you're going to increase that presence, what's being done, what, what's what been done in the past. I, I live in the village. We've had multiple, we've had our window open, tried to be broken into our neighbor's car, all the incidents you guys know. Southport is known, it's almost like we give the biggest candy bars, so everybody come to our town. <laughs> um, it's known, right? So the presence of the police, I do believe, would be a, a really important Thing, and I don't know if you already have presence there, if there could be more presence. We would feel a lot safer if you did, um, because clearly we're a target. So I would just love to know if that could happen. Thank here. you, that's a very important Thank question. You. Yeah. Lieutenant, I, I can make you a captain. No. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let me touch on that. I, 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 I disagree with the, the point that you make that clearly uh, Southport is a target. Um, I, I strongly disagree with that. In this particular case, in this particular incident, it was just a crime of opportunity. It was two kids in a stolen car. They didn't even know where they were. Um, and, you know, and, and I say that, I say that uh, sincerely. Um, this was just a crime of opportunity. They see two women walking up the street, going into the school, and they have a purse on them, and I'm going to try to get that purse, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to do so. Um, and uh, secondly, so I'll touch on uh, what we've done to increase uh, presence. You, you currently have the Red 3 Patrol that works the um, Southport area, um, and that essentially goes from Sasco Creek to Southport and then up uh, Hulls Highway and just about to Testos and then back down Bronson Road. Um, so uh, that Red 3 Patrol handles all the calls for service in that area. Um, that's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and seven days a week. Um, we also have a traffic unit, and when, when things like this happen, we tend to flood our traffic unit into this area. And the reason why we do this is to create an omnipresence. Um, obviously, uh, one patrolman driving around uh, 
you don't you you'll you might see him you know early in the morning but you may not see that person till later on you know that officer till later on in the afternoon um, so what we do is we try to create a a a um, an appearance that there are a lot of police officers mm -hmm. and we do that by, by doing traffic enforcement in certain areas for example Pequot Avenue the post road to make the area less desirable yeah. if you're a criminal and you see police all over the place um, you tend to move away from uh, those areas. Chief, so, can I, can I sure. add that it, it, it does take a village, and if I may, uh, Lieutenant Weha it, it just talked about programs, neighborhood watch, training. Uh, just maybe a show of hands from people in the community. Would you take up that opportunity to find out what tools and resources you have for people that are in the community? Would you raise your hand? So you, you have a avid support group, so maybe we can get numbers and they can, you can set up a program maybe here. The other pitch, if I may, is that uh, the Susquehannock Association, which has their annual meeting tomorrow, I believe at the Southport School, they're an advocacy group for the community. You know, join, be engaged, have your voice and a collective voice, it's important. Your church leaders who are very kind to be here today, their advocates and, and, and being a voice in the community, they're what it's all about. It, it does take a village. Look, our law enforcement through the chief said after the, the activity got engaged, but honestly, we all have our part to do. So I, I think, and I've just cited the, the great participation here today that John Santos mentioned, but we got church leaders, we had associations that are involved. Pequot Library was so generous in, in hosting this event for the broader community. I, I want to thank Mr. North, uh, Chairman of the Board there, for opening up this beautiful space to allow us to have this kind of a community conversation. So again, it takes a village, but as you saw, Lieutenant, the hands that went up in the broader community, perhaps if law enforcement can schedule a program to provide this training and tools that are readily available for us to, to be a, 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 a shiny example to say to people, you know, we're on the lookout. We're gonna protect our neighbors, we're gonna protect our, our community. And you have your RTM members who gave up their afternoon to, to hang out and be here to listen, most of all. So I want to thank you all for being here. So next, please. Monette Hamilton. Yes, hello, everybody. Welcome. Sir. Um, first of all, this is an amazing conversation. I've always welcomed difficult conversations. Um, it's no secret that I am an African-American woman. Um, maybe I try to sneak in, right? Um, but it was traumatizing to hear about what happened to those teachers. And also, what was also traumatizing um, for my husband and I, he's not here, unfortunately, but we didn't even talk about the um, nationality of the assailants that day. Um, we thought the suspect was white, to be honest, because no one said that he was black. And a lot of times, um, we don't want to say the color, especially if I'm black, because people thought they were going to offend me. I don't know every black person. I promise you I don't. And it was kind of important for us to, to have this conversation because again, sometimes when you want to point the finger at other people, those fingers get pointed at you. So because my husband and I assumed the assailants was white, for one, we thought what black person in their right mind would come into this area and rob anyone at seven o'clock in the morning. Let's just be honest. Um, and then also, I mean, right? And then also that 15 year old kid could be a kid in one of our programs. And so of course I'm not thinking that the assailants was black and also he was 15 because no one ever said it. Um, also, this beautiful woman, she stood up and said someone picked her up and swung her around. But again, she never told the description of the suspect. And she said he's still around. So I'm not understanding if this is a culture of just Southport or is this a culture of Connecticut? Because also, when I read the article that morning, it did not state his nationality and that bothered me. I don't know who I'm looking for. And I don't care if he's black, red, yellow, pink, blue. Evil has no color. And he would have robbed me if I was out there. And so I'm, I'm just trying to understand, is there a reason that we're not mentioning the color, the nationality, or is there just a sensitive, what, what is that about? I just need to understand. Could somebody help me with that? So is that a question for us? I don't know. It's a question. <laughs> I'm just noticing when we're talking about crime, we're not mentioning the nationality of the person that we're supposed to be looking for. Yep. Oh, no, no, you please take it. I, oh, I can tell you that when, when we put out an alert, we'll put out whatever descriptive information we have if we feel it's reliable. Mm -hmm. So if we feel that a person reported to us reliably that this was a black male who appeared to be 15 years old, we would put that information out there. So that's from our perspective, because to your point, we want you to be able to recognize the threat. So that's our stance. 
on the, that. The, thank you so much for that. The lady who spoke, she didn't say. She said he was still on the. He was, was African-American. Thank you. But why aren't we saying that? Mm. I, I, right. We have, to, we have to talk about it so we'll know who we're looking for. It is the conversation that we all need to have. Absolutely. So that's, comfort that was to point. know that it's coming from a safe place and it, it, it is not to Absolutely. be taken as derogatory, demeaning, or singling out. The truth is the truth. And whatever color that assailant is, we need to know. I am now Reverend Peggy's I, I think you are neighbor. part of the community and, and you and have a voice to Absolutely. be sure that your neighbor your friends. Absolutely. Your, that day, my husband was walking safe. around with a dark God jacket and shades, and we didn't know that they were looking for someone that was African American. That's important knowledge to know. Well, Trinity so thank Fiscal you so much. is very lucky to have you. Oh, Welcome. and by the way, I'm sorry, really quick, you mentioned, um, I'm sorry to know your name, the wonderful haircut. She mentioned um, programs and, and what programs are happening. Our program is happening in the community, so if you know about youth, send them over to Trinity because there are programs that are out there, there's a lot of times kids are not coming to those programs. So I wanted to put that out there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Trey, you're next. Hi, I'm Bernadette Ceruzzi, and I live in Southport here. <laughs> and I would like to see a better, a bigger police presence in this town, because I've been here for almost 30 years now, and I only see a police car when something happens on 95 and they're chasing some criminals and they crash and they run out um, into South Park. That's about the only time I really see the police cars and I know it's because it's not really where the crime is. But I would like to feel better with you guys driving around a little more often. And then on the safety issue with the walkers and um, bikers and stuff like that. I've almost hit a lot of people in my 30 years. A lot of people are very responsible when they're walking and driving their bikes, but there's a lot that aren't. And there's been a lot of situations where um, I'm coming home from Stop and Shop from, um, and there's a bend that's about a 90 degree bend. At night, there's three people dressed in black Line, side by side, basically taking up the whole side of the road. First of all, they're not even walking on the right side of the road. Um, and it was pitch black, and they were in black, and by the grace of God, I just saw something sparkle, and I did not hit them. But there's been lots of situations like that. And the bikers, I've been at a stop sign ready to take a right, and I notice there's a biker just drive, not even going to stop at the stop sign. But these things happen often, and especially with the bikers. I don't even think they're people from the town, because I know a lot of people love to bike around Southport. Um, but I don't know if there's some way of... I'll, I'll just touch on that quickly. So there are laws in place that uh, not only motor vehicles or operators of motor vehicles, but also pedestrians and bicyclists must abide by. Um, they don't in this town. I know that they don't. I know that they don't. And we tried to do a, an education component. Um, can you imagine? I mean, there are probably 50%, I'll say 20% of the community that doesn't like us to begin with. Can you imagine if we were handing out infractions to pedestrians walking in the downtown area? <laughs> so, and I say that facetiously, but in, 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 in all seriousness, um, we, we do our best. We do, a, during the spring, we do a pedestrian kind of enforcement uh, program where we go out and if you identify someone who's, who's not walking in the crosswalk or jaywalking across the street, and they always look at the police officer like, are you crazy? Are, are, are there not bigger things that, you know, bigger fish to fry? But at the same time, it is very important and it does, it does help to reduce our uh, pedestrian fatalities. And, and if I may add, I, I think it's also important that, that, you know, it's getting darker earlier. We have leaves on the ground and cars can't react as much. So if you're walking, be sensitive of bearing, wearing reflective clothing. If you're biking, there are laws and, 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 and moving vehicle regulations you need to be conscious of. But, but it, again, it, it takes a village and everybody, but, but people need to know that they can't be seen. 
and it's a risk. But reflectors, I tell you, yeah. I stop in the middle of the road to tell somebody, yeah. thank you. I can see you loud and clear. Yeah. And it, it matters because daylight is daylight savings and, and people, you can't expect cars to stop, particularly on these leaves and roads and, and the challenging dynamics. So it, 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 it's a whole dynamic. I mean, Most God people. bless, we had all the solutions, but we're trying, right? It, it's just that communications level, so thank you. Yeah. Tony, could I add something? Yeah. And I was going to mention it also when Carolyn mentioned uh, traffic safety, but we also have a Bike and Pedestrian Commission in town who does a lot of great work on promoting pedestrian and cycling safety. So if there is like an intersection you see that needs fog lines or you need a crosswalk or things like that, they're really, they're really great advocates. Um, and they can work directly with your RTM reps or if it's a state road, someone like me or Laura or uh, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and then you go before the police commission. So just this week, we got a number of really great pedestrian safety projects passed. Um, so I just put that Good on point. your radar, and, I, and I'm hopeful with this new infrastructure bill, we can get some funds for more sidewalks. <laughs> if you go to the town's website, bike and pet, okay. we'll, we'll get that information. I mean, and it's the bikers. It's, it's a big issue with the bikers, because mm -hmm. my daughter and I have a game where we watch bikers just drive right through the stop signs all the time. And they're not, well, they're not any of you guys, are, I know they're people from out of town. Because they, <laughs> they, they, they love to drive through South Thank Korea you very much, South appreciate it. We'll follow up, okay? Thank you. Please. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name is Trey, I'm a, I'm a teacher here in town, in Fairfield, I should say, not in this town. And I am, um, I had a few, just remarks to share here, um, partly because the teacher and me, I'm compelled to say some things, and um, I told my students I'd come and speak up, right? Because it's necessary to speak up. I've got to speak up. Um, so, so there's a few things that I just wanted to bring to your attention because I am a black male, and I do have children, and um, when I saw the, the word public safety, as you can imagine, um, it, it, it it made me feel some type of way. I was concerned, right? Because historically, the idea of public safety and criminality has been synonymous with young black males, all right? And I happen to have a son who is um, a young black male. I happen to be also uh, a black male. So um, as we navigate these, these topics, you know, I have to say that um, there's almost none of us here, young black males. And so as you are concerned about your safety, understand that we too have uh, concerns about our safety, what's happening, Robert. Um, so there's, that's one. The other thing that I wanted to bring up here is that there, there seems to be an unwillingness to examine the root cause of, of these crimes being committed. Um, I think that we have to invest in, in that part of the problem as well, that like um, these don't just happen um, at random, right? There is, there is a reason there and it's worth examining. Um, civilians have learned to associate, as, as I just said, um, blackness and brownness with criminality. And I would love it if there was more work around also um, anti-bias kind of education, um, because I think that that makes a difference. And I know that um, my life and my safety is in the balance, you know, especially when there's, there's a civilian, again, who's, who's trained uh, to be concerned and, and that their safety concern oftentimes is associated with my presence. Um, and I worry about the weaponization of the word safety. Um, I hope that you and politicians are, are encouraging civilians to be a bit more cognizant of what that means and what that looks like. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Whitmore, Hello. Laura. Reverend Laura Whitmore. I'm really kind of, it's kind of a PSA type, but first, we have met, you did a fabulous, I just want you to know, a fabulous uh, safety program with us at South Fork Congregational Church about five or six years ago when we were concerned about the safety of our preschool um, and everything that you gave us, all the directives and everything was so helpful and, and helped us to have this in place when we heard about this incident. So I wanted to thank you and encourage all of you to, to use that um, resource because it was fabulous. Um, Number two, I, 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 I feel like I might be beating a dead horse here, but I will follow up on the texting um, thing because our daughter is a teacher at the Southport School. She did text us immediately when that happened. That then allowed us to 
contact our preschool director, who then contacted uh, Trinity's preschool director, then Paul was able to call Peggy, all of this in like a minute and a half of getting that information out. So that, that texting segment is just so important, I think, because in all honesty, and I'm a little old, but every uh, people younger than me, they're all texters. They're not reading their emails or anything. I know that. We're church. We get that. Um, and then um, the last two are just kind of questions that I have for you. One is that I think we're aware that we're on a drug corridor from New York to Boston for the most part. Um, so one of my questions is, are these um, car incidences happening as part of that, or are these something that's happening from gang work in other places? And then, and following on that, um, we have a pickleball court in our driveway, and so we move our cars a lot, and literally the one night that my kids moved our car and we didn't lock up two of the four cars in our driveway, they were both, they can't say broken into because they hadn't been locked, so they were rifled through. Um, so that makes me ask, was that a really bizarre coincidence? Or is this happening on a daily, kind of not daily, but on a regular basis that, peop that these people are coming through, checking people's cars really quickly? Because it seems very odd to me that on the literally the one night in 27 years that that happened. So those are my two kind of questions. So um, the, the, it happens on a nightly basis. Okay. And it's just a matter of, is it your neighborhood or is it, Naps Highway, or is it Brooklawn Avenue, or is it Greenfield Hill? Um, and basically what uh, these kids do is they uh, get dropped off with someone in a stolen car, and they'll drop off four or five kids, as many as they can load in, and they will just walk in the shadows up the driveways, uh, pull on as many door handles if they get in. They uh, look through the interior of the car, rifle through for anything that they could find of value. As soon as you put the foot on the brake, the green light comes on the button. If the green light pops up, they know that the key fob is in there and they drive away with your car as well. So it's, it's really a crime of opportunity. And if they don't get it out of your driveway, they might get it out of the next driveway or the driveway after. So um, you had like two or three questions in there. Um, my other was just the, the, the drug corridor between New York and Boston. Are we, are, because we are with the train and the highway, are we at a higher risk? No. Or is no. it just, that's just the reality of, yep. of where it, we are? It might be Southport tonight and it might be uh, Greenfield Hill tomorrow night and, Got you know, it. the beach area. And, and we've seen it across town. There is, there is nowhere and in, in fact, the town. This that, was a crime spree that began in Guilford, went down to Bramford, that's right. went down to Norwalk, yeah. and then worked its Came way up to Southport. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so these are, I, I think it's important to emphasize that this was a, a, a random act, unfortunately, that occurred, but nevertheless, it, it, it's still quite a, a, a jolt to everybody. Yeah. And, and, and this is yeah. part of why we're here, having this yeah. kind of community. And then the last thing I'll say is, uh, it could be because I live and work on Pequot Avenue, I actually see you guys in your cars around the neighborhood a lot. So, Please uh, give her a hand. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Hi, could I ask, um, hi Tony, Tony can I ask one question? I'm so sorry, before we switch topics. I was just wondering if the Chief could follow up on whether or not we have a higher incidence in Fairfield of car theft because of our proximity to 95. And I thought I had read somewhere that when you, the closer you are to an interstate, the, the, the higher incidents there are of car theft. So that, that's kind of common sense. Obviously there's easier ingress and egress and we have the Merritt Parkway and I-95. So, um, and, and when we get uh, alerted that there is a stolen car and it's usually by a police officer that is sitting at a certain location and sees the car go by and says, oh, there was an Audi stolen out of Greenwich yesterday and he identifies that, you know, we get lists, you know, and 30 cars on a list, you can identify them as you see, and see them and when they're driving around at 3.30, 4 in the morning, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that that car is doing 76 miles an hour and it's it loaded with kids, it's probably a stolen car. Um, the unfortunate part of that is our hands are, our, our, our actions are limited when that happens. Um, we cannot pursue them. So 
Uh, we notify the other officers in the area. We kind of build a perimeter to some extent and try to notify. We, what we do is we notify other agencies over the hotline, what's called the hotline, and the dispatchers just call the other dispatchers of the uh, officers up the 95 corridor and everyone gets notified and usually what happens is eventually they'll get on 95 or they'll get on the Merritt Parkway. We will determine the direction that they're traveling and then we will notify over the hotline where they're going and then those other agencies will pick it up uh, in most cases and uh, communicate but that But you are to not them. allowed to chase. We are not allowed to chase. Yeah, that's that true. Even on the correct. highway. Well, we can, we can make an attempt to pull them over, but as soon as they take off, yeah. And that, and that I'm not encouraging this from anyone, but even if we, if we, let's say you were doing 35 and a 25, and I pulled behind you as a police officer, and you just said, I'm not stopping, and you just took off. We have, it's, it's a, an infraction, so there's nothing. Part of the rationale do. is there have been incidental collateral yeah. accidents as a result of high-speed chases. That's so correct. it's not just the, the law. It's no, no, what, what we have to do as safety. police officers is balance the danger to the public, the danger to the police officer, to the value of what, the, what we might be catching them for. Right. So we are limited to personal crimes of person. Great. Please. Hi, Christine Brown. Um, I'm a Fair, Fairfield resident, and we've talked a lot today about anecdotally about the incident here in Southport and I'm wondering if maybe the police officers or anyone else could share with us information on um, like data on is crime worse this year in Fairfield and Southport or was this sort of an isolated incident or kind of what are the trends that are what are the numbers showing us in terms of the trends so the, the, this was an isolated incident, and I'm not going to say that it can't happen in 10 minutes, but obviously um, things like this don't happen in Southport to some extent, you know? Um, but I can share with you some statistics um, that I have from, from our police department. Uh, just with um, thefts of motor vehicle and stolen motor vehicles, and, and what I'll do is I'll compare those statistics to the rest of Fairfield. So Southport to the rest of Fairfield. Uh, theft from motor vehicles, in the Southport area, um, you have, for the year 2021, you have 72 thefts from motor vehicles, and townwide, we have 336. So 72 in Southport and 336 in the town of Fairfield. Uh, stolen vehicles in Southport, 2021, we have 18. And in the town of Fairfield, we have 87. And in, for residential burglaries, we have four in Southport, four in Southport and 25 in the town. Um, so I can also share with you, I'll, I'll share with you the town-wide statistics for um, from 2019 to 2021 in Fairfield as a whole. Um, so 2019, 248 thefts from motor vehicle, 2020, 414, and so far in 2021, 336. Um, stolen vehicles, 2019, 54, 2020, 99, and 2021, so far, 87. Um, so we're probably on track to match or um, increase. Um, but you see a significant difference between 2019 to 2021, yeah, significant difference. Chief, is that due to COVID? Is it due to, in, in your opinion, just uh, just a thought from your expert opinion? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think you know, we could say idle hands are the devil's workshop, but I don't know if that's <laughs> necessarily, uh, you know, everyone's home with COVID during, you know, home, you know, dealing with the uh, kind of things not, not happening uh, around. I don't think uh, in 2021 things started to lift, so I don't necessarily think, um, you know, maybe it had some impact, uh, but I don't know Great. if it was too significant. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's our okay. last one. Uh, thank you. 
Um, I'm Alo Stokes, and I just wanted to bring up an issue that has not been touched on here yet, but it is happening in our village, and that is check washing. And I want you to know that, according to the police report, this is happening here, and uh, it's another reason that people are becoming fearful about living here in Southport. And as I've talked to friends, I have to tell you, they're buying guns. And that scares me. I mean, one of the founders of Connecticut Against Gun Violence back in the early 90s. So when I hear this reaction to life here in Southport, and I do think it's being impacted by the national media. I don't think it's strictly a result of just life in Southport, but I do think we have to be aware that there are serious ramifications to everything you do as a police department and people in Hartford. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for your engagement. And, and uh, we, we will be ending the program, but Alice brings up another interesting point, and maybe uh, the, uh, the chief or, or lieutenant could offer about uh, scams, uh, fraud, online scams, uh, senior type of dynamics. Uh, uh, could you just offer programs that you have, and I know you have, but if you could share with the broader public programs that you have as it relates to supporting and, and raising awareness on fraud, online scams, and things to that effect, yeah, as a gamut and, uh, of... The microphone went off, so I'll just talk about it. Is it back on? Okay. So, yeah, we, um, we offer educational opportunities for seniors, and we um, cover exactly those things. And uh, you work with the Bigelow Center in regards to these programs, correct? Yes. Yeah, and we've already done, uh, we've done a chat with the seniors at St. Pius, we've done a chat with the seniors oh. at Trinity Baptist Church, so kind of like a small tour. So when they ask us to come, they organize their seniors into a group, and we come and we do like a one hour, one and a half hour chat with them. I think you just added more work because I think there may be other programs at, at uh, Trinity uh, as well as uh, Congregational. Uh, I want to respect people's time, so it's, 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 it's 2.30. Oh, oh, Reiny? Real quick, I just want to make a plug for um, Fairfield's Juvenile Review Board um, because not all kids who make mistakes come from out of town. We have kids in town that make mistakes. And they're also, um, there's a, it's a great opportunity for them to be referred to by the courts. And from what I hear, there's very few that are reoffenders. And they view actually, you know, years down the road, they say, oh, this was the best thing that happened to me because it helped me get on a better path. So any interested residents who are passionate and want to sit on the board, they can connect um, with Detective Leach and she can advise you further. Thank you. And I want to put a plug for, for Riney and the great work that she does for Fairfield Cares in our community. So thank you, Riney. Um, <laughs> thank you. Oh, no, no. We Go came ahead. in with the incident that happened in South Fork, and I want to commend the police how quickly and how efficiently and how effectively they apprehended the suspects and what a super job you're doing. And I don't think half the town doesn't like you. <laughs> you, are, you are here for us, and I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, we, yeah, we talked a lot about the slippage, the slippage, what happened, but in reality, you guys are doing huge job and you did a great job so yeah we can fix a few things here and there but you, you guys are epic and I appreciate all that you do thank you uh, and, and I, I'll also add that if 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 anybody you know we we do our best to try to reach out to the community as best we can um, if you have a church or a school or or anywhere that you have a gathering um, just reach out to us, Lieutenant Wire. He's in charge of community outreach and uh, public information. 
So just reach out to us. You go to our website and you can ask us anything and you can even get us to come to any of your, or of your groups. It is a very important component to, to us because without you, there's a lot of information that we will be missing. Listen, I want to be online when someone calls you epic. <laughs> epic. That's nice. What's important is for us to follow up with you with some of the particular action plans that, that we talked about. And I'll work with the chief and, and through my colleagues and the RTM members and my delegation colleagues to be able to follow up with action plans that we can put into place. Oh. Can I just ask? Oh, come on. Uh. All right, I'll come to you. Ostensibly for one reason, which is this crime. Could we please get a follow up? as to what happens with the perpetrators. Yes. Uh, just to see perhaps a, a chronology. Where did these people come from? What was their first crime? Um, so, a human interest story that would give us all the complexities involved in this case. Because it's not a simple, it's not a simple crime. One, one thing that I have to say is that because it is a juvenile case, the sensitivity of it changes when it, with respect to the judicial system so we can't share all the uh, we can share what we can share we will share what we can share I actually called the uh, detention center in Bridgeport to inquire about these two a few days ago and they really can release very little information as the chief said about the outcome but I do think that is one of the things as state legislatures we are talking about which is collecting more data on um, the percentage of these cases where juveniles are detained and, and that sort of information so we can have the second half of the, the piece of the puzzle. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you, Pequot Library, for hosting us. Grateful. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. All right.